Welcome to Healthcare Matters, bringing you the latest insights and innovations shaping the future of healthcare. My name is Peter Birch, and this episode is powered by Arab Health in partnership with M42. In this episode, we're exploring biobanking and the impact it has on preventative public health strategies. Joining me today is Paul Downey, General Manager for the Abu Dhabi Biobank, which is an integral part of M42's commitment to driving healthcare innovation through innovative solutions and data-centric technologies. G'day, Paul, how are you going? Morning, nice to meet you. It's great to have you here in the studio to explore biobanking and the opportunities it presents. But firstly, tell me a little bit more about biobanking, what it is and why it matters. Sure. So there's a bit of a misconception about what a biobank is. And the, I think the general understanding is it's a freezer full of biological samples, which is a component of a biobank, but isn't a biobank per se. A biobank really is the study of people at, in, at scale, so at population level. And it's an understanding of how people live their lives, how they interact with their environment, the choices they make in their lifestyle, and their biology, so their genes, their gut flora, and all of, how all of those factors influence their health over time, and that some people go on to develop disease, and other people don't and live to an old age relatively unscathed. And a biobank, because it's at scale, allows researchers to unpick those uh, details, if you like, and understand the contributions to health and the contributions to disease. There'd be some interesting insights there and probably useful to a number of different parts of the healthcare system. I'd love to understand a little bit more about uh, its importance to public health specifically and, and preventative. Sure. So, so probably one of the first published biobanks and probably the, one of the most impactful actually was the 1958 doctor study by uh, Sir Richard Bell, uh, Sir Richard Dole, sorry, um, where he studied in excess of 3,000 doctors in the UK, half of which smoked and half of which didn't. And he, over time, he was able to prove the, the cohort of doctors that smoked were more likely to develop lung cancer than those that didn't. So he statistically proved that there was a link between smoking and lung cancer. So that's an early but very important example of the impact on, on public health. And the, there have been many other uh, such discoveries through biobanks around the benefits of, say, statins on re reducing cardiovascular disease, but also they have a, an additional benefit of being protective against cancer, which is something you could never unearth in a, in a clinical trial. It just wouldn't be sufficiently powered. So you have to, have to operate the biobank at the population level to see these synergistic effects. Yeah, yeah, I see. I'd love to understand it in a bit more context and, um, you know, the practical application. So the Abu Dhabi Biobank, uh, are there some initiatives that you can talk about? Sure, there's, I mean, there's a number of uh, tenants to the Abu Dhabi Biobank. One is um, creating a stem cell bank for the local community. So, so stem cells are the, the cells that are available in the umbilical cord when a baby is born, and they're undifferentiated and have the power to become other cell types within the human body. So essentially a kind of a bio repair kit, if you like. So one of the, one of the uh, missions of the Abu Dhabi Biobank is to set up a large, well-matched uh, stem cell bank. And by well-matched, I mean genetically well-matched the MRRT population, that there is a very likely, a very good likelihood of matching the stem cell from a baby with a patient with, with a disease uh, where the transplant would work well. Um, and stem cells can be used to treat in excess of 80 life-threatening conditions such as leukemia and thalassemia, which is prevalent in the region. So that's, that's one component of it. The other one is a, is a pan-human biobank. And really that's the kind of longitudinal con concept where you're following people that are notionally well through their lives, periodically sampling them, understanding how they're living their lives, what they're exposed to, what their occupation is. Your occupation could be quite significant to your health. And then understanding their health outcomes. But, but, but the end point really is working with world leading research organizations, pharma companies, academia, uh, GMOs, to, to, to make this available for groundbreaking research to, to come up with new medications, new diagnostics, new interventions. And the interventions may be therapy or it may be simply lifestyle. Yeah, interesting. Like getting all those insights no doubt to do that you need a lot of data you need a lot of information which then brings up those 
you know, concerns in healthcare, you, we need to make sure that we've got privacy covered. And, and you know, in addition to privacy and, and the governance around that, there's also those, those ethical questions too, you know, just because we can doesn't mean we should type stuff. So I'd love to understand, you know, how Abu Dhabi Biobank approaches those um, concerns around privacy and ethics. No, it's, it's a very good question and it's a key concern. And uh, uh, the foundation really is informed consent. What that means is that the person volunteering to donate their samples and information about their life and health is completely aware of how that information is going to be used, who will have access to it, under what restrictions. So, so we developed a very robust and clear informed consent information leaflet and form. But beyond that, there's an oversight committee, an ethics oversight committee that will look at the strategic plan and the aims of the biobank. And, and make recommendations and adjustments, but really there to, to monitor the ethical trajectory of the biobank. And beyond that, there is an access panel, which is multidisciplinary, disciplinary, which will review applications to use the health data, check that they are bona fide researchers, check that it's solid science and it's in the interest of human health. And the final uh, layer of protection really is that the samples and data are pseudonymized, which means we break the link from the donor um, with a with a a new code that identifies the samples and data, which means which means nothing really to anybody unless you have the key to link it back to the individual. Yeah, so you've got those checks and balances in place, and um, that's super important. I, I'm thinking about you know in any area that's um, emerging or innovative or, or new, particularly in healthcare, um, it sometimes it's not always a, a a smooth road that's paved. There's often challenges, but also presents opportunities too. Um, talk me through some of the challenges and opportunities around biobanking at the moment. So, so the, the opportunity and a challenge at the same time is that, um, as, as we've discussed already, there are many influences on, on health some of them passive, the background pollution, some of them active choices that you make within your life to smoke, to take exercise, to drink alcohol, to eat good food, to eat bad food. Um, so there are many, many sources of data that we need to bring together to give this holistic picture of how a person lives their life, but apply that on a population level. So the challenge there is the aggregation of all that all those data sets to obtain them, to bring them to, together, to coordinate them, to protect them, and then to make them available to researchers. So it's both a challenge and an opportunity, but only by doing so do you get this full picture of an individual and a population. Actually, if I was to double click on that a little bit more and um, you know, pulling together all those different data sets or um, you know, getting that, that holistic picture, I imagine collaborations and partnerships with the ecosystem are a really important part. I think you touched on it earlier in the discussion too, you know, making that information available to research and other parts. Walk me through what these types of collaborations and partnerships look like and why they're so important. Sure. I mean, there's some practical challenges around just the mechanics of it, the IT in particular, making it serviceable and robust and secure. So the Abu Dhabi Biobank has partnered with Microsoft uh, to help develop this, this data warehouse as it's known. Uh, and the and the showcase layer that sits on top that allows you to view the data within the warehouse and decide whether to make an application or not to to use the resource. And then beyond that, um, you know, the, the the scope of the Abu Dhabi Biobank is to to facilitate research into the A to Z of disease. In effect, it's not a cardiovascular per study per se. It's not a cancer study per se. It wants to be broad spectrum. So. We have to to, 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 to capitalize on its value, we have to partner with world leading researcher organizations, both commercially and academic. An example would be the IARC, the Inst International Agency for Research on Cancer in Lyon, world leading research agency on cancer. We are developing a partnership with their academics to, to look at the, the, the oncology cases within the Abu Dhabi Biobank. Yeah, got you. And then if I was to take, you know, where we've got to with biobanking so far and some of those wins and the opportunities there looking ahead um thinking about the future what's exciting you about this area of biobank so so what what is particularly exciting me about the abu dhabi biobank uh, com as compared to some of the others so the uk biobank was probably the first and is probably still the world's most prominent biobank it's about 20 years old now and is following half a million brits but that's a static biobank in a sense in that 
it's an observational study. People join and then they're followed throughout their lives and ultimately they pass away uh, and researchers will look at that data set. The Abu Dhabi Biobank is different. We're a, we're a living biobank. So we have uh, the ability to recall people into particular studies, research studies, for which they are suitable based on their lifestyle, their phenotype or their genetics, their genotype. And by doing so, we can, uh, we can facilitate the acceleration of personalized medicine. So rather than this trial and error approach of giving a medication, it doesn't work, try a different one. You know that because of the person's genotype and lifestyle, that this particular medication is suitable at a particular dose, and this me medication is unsuitable. And only by doing these precision clinical trials can you accelerate that understanding. Yeah. Well, Aaron, that's, that's so on point for, um, you know, the current climate when we're talking about we need personalized solutions um, to, to address the burden of chronic disease and, um, you know, the, this focus on preventative health is really clear. So, Paul, I really appreciate you taking the time to take us through this, this exciting and innovative space. Thank you so much. Thank you. And thank you for tuning in to Healthcare Matters. Make sure you're subscribed over on YouTube, Apple Podcasts and Spotify. So you can be at the forefront of the healthcare insights that matter. My name's Peter Birch. This episode was powered by Arab Health in partnership with M42. I'll see you next time.